Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Good morning everyone, those who are in the room and those who are attending the talk remotely. Today we have the pleasure to have Eleftheria Georgianti. Uh, she is a PhD student in the University of Patras in Greece and got her master's degree in electrical and computer engineering in 2007. So for the last six years she has been a PhD student and had the opportunity to visit a lot of places, being uh, nine months in the Technical University of Denmark. Then she visited Philips Research in Eindhoven in the Netherlands and spent some time in University of Oldenburg always doing audio research and audio processing. So today she's going to talk about her findings and her results. Without further ado, Lifteria, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the introduction. So my name is Eleftheria Georgadi. I'm pronouncing it also in the Greek way. And um, I will uh, give you an overview of my research experience during the last uh, six years of my uh, work. So the contents of this presentation, I will initially introduce myself, uh, although I, I got already a good introduction. Uh, and then I will uh, let you know of, my, of the topic of my PhD thesis and I will provide you an overview of it. And uh, I will uh, emphasize on four uh, segments of my PhD work uh, related to the analysis of statistical properties of room responses and signals. Um, I will present you uh, two methods for the estimation of distance between a source and a receiver um, uh, from a single channel and binaural signals, a method for, the room, for room classification and uh, a, a, method, a framework for, the method, for a method for the estimation of acoustical parameters such, a, such as the direct reverberant ratio or clarity. And I will also refer to some side projects which are not actually part of my PhD work, but I have uh, spent some time working uh, in other uh, topics um, while being in Philips uh, or while collaborating with other colleagues in my laboratory at the University of Patras um, related to automatic calibration of uh, an ambient telephony system, uh, subjective evaluation of uh, signal enhancement techniques, and finally, some uh, work related to architectural room acoustics, uh, which we have quite some experience in, the, in my group. And I will finish this presentation with some ideas for the future. So my university is uh, where I come from, is the University of Patras. It's, uh, uh, you can see this red dot, this is where Patras is, it's like 250 kilometers from Athens. Uh, my a uh, small group is uh, the audio and the acoustics technology group, which is a part of the bigger group uh, called Wire Communications Laboratory and has all these uh, other uh, groups uh, you can see here. We are actually um, a small group, I think, for, in my opinion. So the, our, my professor, the, the head of the group is uh, Professor John Mouzopoulos. We, are, we have three postdoc students and we are three PhD students. And there, are, there is a wide variety of topics that we've been working on, but the, the expertise of the group is uh, um, audio signal processing, uh, room correction, uh, signal enhancement techniques. But there are also some other topics that they are not so signal processing uh, or, uh, um, let's say, um, with, uh, um, uh, for example, um, Fotis, who is doing some uh, no, um, working on uh, sound reproduction, on novel sound reproduction devices, or uh, Babis, who is uh, working with acoustic energy harvesting. Uh, concerning me, uh, um, Dr. Tasev also um, told you about my background. I've been um, working on my PhD from 2007 and had the chance to collaborate with other groups, as you can see here. Um, I have spent some nine months at the Technical University of Denmark collaborating with uh, Dr. Finn Jakobsen, who unfortunately passed away last week. 
and uh, getting a, a good insight on physical acoustics, which uh, and this is something that I didn't have so good background uh, before that. Then another nine months at Philips Research, collaborating with Dr. Stephen Van de Parra and Taiki Harma. And um, since we have started a, established a good collaboration, I spent another three months uh, at the University of Oldenburg, where uh, Dr. Stephen Van de Parra uh, got a position, a professor position, uh, last year. And um, I'm now in the final stage of my PhD degree. degree. I have actually already finished up, uh, finished the writing, and presented in the first uh, committee. And I still have to do the final presentation uh, in September. And uh, something else that I've been also um, participating, in, partic I have also participated in, is the intellectual group of ABBA, which is a a grouping of various laboratories in Europe and also in the States. And everybody's working with binaural um, techniques and methodologies, and we try to exchange uh, uh, knowledge, collaborate, and uh, to further improve um, the understanding of the mechanisms, but also propose some novel methodologies for signal processing. So we'll. Uh, start with the basic concept of uh, my PhD work and uh, everything that has to do with audio and acoustics, and of course this is uh, reverberation. We know very well that room acoustics introduce reverberation, and we can fully describe this uh, um, phenomenon with uh, the room impulse response, which can be uh, easily de determined following a standard methodology with, by um, driving a sweep signal, for example, a specific excitation signal in the room, and we record it with a microphone, we can uh, um, divide it in the frequency domain or deconvolve the two signals in the time domain, and we get the expressions of the room impulse response and the room transfer function in the time domain and the room transfer function in the frequency domain. And of course, these are complete acoustical descriptions containing all the information we need for the acoustical properties of the room and um, how the acoustics uh, affect the signals that they are reprodu reproduced uh, in the rooms. And of course, uh, it's known that the uh, room responses will um, vary across different positions in the room. So for example, here you can see at position one, we would have a more flat response and less deviations in the frequency domain than uh, in the case of position two, which is a, a, a as, uh, at a further distance. My PhD topic um, is entitled Modeling, Analysis and Processing of Acoustical Room Responses and Signals Under Reverberant Conditions. And uh, bearing in mind all these, uh, these uh, things that I told you in the previous slide, that the room responses contain all this important information for the acoustic engineer, uh, my, my task was to try to determine attributes that normally are it's easy to, uh, to extract from responses directly from signals. So getting in the room, recording signals, and then from the signals try to estimate acoustical parameters, the um, distance between the source and receiver, and so on. Uh, the way we uh, have approached this problem was uh, is based on the, okay, this simple um, relationship that the uh, anechoic signal when it is reproduced in a room, it's, uh, uh, we get the reverberant signal, which is a convolution of the room impulse response for, the, for this pair of positions and uh, the anechoic signal. Uh, in the frequency domain, we would have a multiplication, but we can also face these uh, uh, expressions of the signal, the anechoic and reverberant signal and the room transfer function as distributions, as statistical distributions. And we try to determine what are the statistical relationships between these three components and try to find whether some statistical measures are related to statistical parameters, for example, the direct to reverberant ratio, clarity, and so on, and try to extract models for each of these uh, three uh, components with emphasis on the response part, on the room, room transfer function. And uh, as a final aim, try to examine the potentials or the potential uh, of uh, using this knowledge for uh, for the development of novel techniques, signal processing techniques. Um, so I will start with uh, some 
um, uh, an overview of uh, uh, analysis of statistical properties of responses and signals. I hope it's clear uh, why I'm motivated to, to do this, and I hope it will get more clear uh, as I further continue. Uh, so, as I have already mentioned, we have a convolution in the time domain, which is a multiplication in the frequency domain. And then, if we we're trying to determine the different um, relationships between these uh, three expressions. And I, I have already done some work. Um, just uh, the first step was to, to do some things um, to examine this relationship just by observing things, just taking the, the, the histograms, plotting them for the anechoic signal, the response, and the reverberant signal, and try to see if they're related, how they change with distance, with other. Um, um, uh, with another room, within other rooms, and so on. So, the, um, the uh, we emphasized on the statistical measures of standard deviation, and there is a good reason to do that, uh, as I will uh, let you know in a while. And the kurtosis, which seems to work quite well, and uh, we tried to create some models for the standard deviation, the kurtosis of the room responses, and try to estimate the statistical measures of the sun deviation the kurtosis from the reverberant signals. So the idea was to find a model for the room transfer function and then use only the reverberant signal in order to extract information for the these statistical measures of the anechoic signal. Please. So the reverberant signal, do you mean like a special signal like a sweep or do you mean like speech? It's speech. It can be any type of, of signal. Mm -hmm. For this uh, analysis, it can be any type of signal. The methods I will ref refer to afterwards are um, developed for speed signals. Yeah, but it shouldn't be, of course, a sweep signal. Yeah, the idea is not to use these excitation signals and use um, uh, any common signals. So, um, the, um, uh, writing some uh, similar relationships, we, can, uh, we have the convolution time domain, frequency domain uh, uh, multiplication, and the addition of in the dB domain. Denoting then each of these three terms uh, as you can see here, with, uh, I have also used different colors. We can assume, assuming that X and Y are independent random variables, then we can find some relationships for the standard deviation. This is spectral standard deviation, so we are in the frequency domain. We look at the, magni at the magnitude of the frequency response, and this is the standard deviation of uh, these three, uh, the Z, uh, S, sigma, Z refers to the reverberant signal, sigma x to the transfer function and the uh, y to the signal. And we can find some relationships for these two statistical measures for these three. Uh, yes, yes, please. You need to be positive to take sorry, sorry? For, for logarithms to be able to take logarithms. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. It's a theory. Then these things should be positive in the frequency domain. Or in general, they're complex. Right? You mean po a positive, a positive uh, like no negative. values? Yeah, positive. Right? Yeah, so uh, of course you can always uh, sw sw um, sweet, sweet, shift the frequency response wherever you want. So it's actually the, the relationship between the spectral values that actually um, is of interest for us. So the actual absolute values, the dB values, if they are positive or negative, it's not of concern at this uh, point. Okay. Is it? Magnitudes. Yes, okay. these are magnitudes. Yeah. And is this per frequency, do, uh, per frequency beam or you try to do some general statistics? Yeah, so it's uh, for specific frequency bands, the analysis. Uh, you can use either one third octave uh, fraction uh, analysis or uh, wider um, um, frequency bands. I have I have done several tests uh, with, uh, in order to find um, what would be the most appropriate uh, frequency and bandwidth analysis, depending on the application that you want to uh, end up. So the reason we have uh, used the standard deviation was that there is the well-known work of uh, Manfred Schroeder in uh, 1954 that he saw that the, the spectrum standard deviation, when we are in a distance uh, for distances above the critical distance, uh, the standard deviation, the spectral standard deviation, converges to the, ha, takes the uh, va values that is close to 5.6 dB. So when we are in the f diffuse sound field in the room. And then also uh, Yetz, JJ Yetz, in 1979, he saw that the sp standard deviation would increase. So when we are very close to the source, we have, let's say, a microphone and the sound source very close, we will have 
smaller spectral sun deviation, of course, the, the spectrum would be flatter. There will be more deviations. So the idea is that the more you increase the distance, more deviations will appear on the spectrum. And this can be captured with a spectral standard deviation. So we have an increase up to the critical distance of the room, which depends on the reverberation time and the volume of each of the rooms. And uh, according to the to Schrader's theory, above this distance, you would have a specific uh, standard deviation value, which is 5.6 decibels. So that's why we decided in these first steps of, uh, of uh, my analysis to, to use uh, the, the metric of standard deviation, which is there was already some existing, let's say, knowledge uh, about it. So here you can also see some results uh, I, using one third octave band analysis or full band analysis. So this is the, spe the standard deviation of the spectrum of the room impulse response across the frequency base. Exactly, yeah. OK, 0 means absolutely flat, and 3 dB, 4 dB means It gets uh, more deviated. So this is the standard deviation of the response. And we were trying to see, uh, as I already saw you, this um, that we have found a, a relationship between the standard deviation of the of the reverberant, the response, and the anechoic signal. We were trying to relate these three components, uh, and using also this uh, model. So the let's say the the, the this is actually the the base, the the framework that my PhD thesis has been uh, uh, was based on it. Um, so, uh, uh, as a further step, we decided to, to try to estimate distance from signal channel signals. And uh, the idea is, uh, as you can see here in the figure, there is, we have a speaker which is uh, uh, situated uh, at a specific distance from the microphone. And this can be also used, in, um, for example, in an open um, a conference call, or uh, if you have multiple devices in a room, you might need to know the distance between the, the speaker and uh, the device. So we were trying to find some ways to do that. Uh, one easy way was to okay, take the sound level, the sound pressure level of the speaker and say, OK, if, it's, uh, if it gets closer, it will get uh, higher and so on. But of course, this is not a good idea, because each one of us would uh, speak in a different way, uh, depending on the, whether it's a, it is a man or a woman, and so on. So we tried to use some statistical features that depend on distance, and uh, relate and uh, employ pattern recognition techniques, machine learning uh, techniques, in order to develop a method for the distance estimation. So as I have uh, already told you, the first thing to do was to try to observe what is happening. So here you can see reverberant signals. These are uh, speed signals, the frequency spectrum of uh, uh, signals recorded at 0 0.5 meters, 1 meter, 2 meters, and 3 meters. And you can see that the histogram uh, changes. And uh, these changes could be captured, probably, uh, with kurtosis and skewness. Kurtosis shows how um, far is the distribution from the normal distribution, how picky it gets or how flat it is, it changes uh, with this. And skewness shows how asymmetrical it is. So we use these two features. And here you can see how they behave across time, uh, across uh, different time frames, uh, the skewness and the kurtosis. And it's uh, evident that they are really distance dependent. So the idea was to use these two uh, attributes and also some other ones uh, related to the residual of the linear, predic linear prediction residual, which, is, uh, which works mainly for speech. Uh, also, a nonce detector, which is this last uh, uh, line of the, of the code. And uh, uh, using all these parameters and uh, employing pattern recognition techniques, Okay, uh, we, co we could um, develop a, a method for the distance estimation from single channel signals. Uh, for this method, we have employed uh, Gaussian mixture models and used uh, the five uh, uh, features I have uh, already shown to you. And their filter versions only for 10 to 15 kilohertz. Uh, so full band, but also for a, a, a smaller frequency range. And uh, we have evaluated the method. And you can see here that when the system is trained with uh, the same speakers that it's um, evaluated, the method um, got 72%. And then when the speaker is, un is, is unknown, we got uh, 
um, um, a worse um, performance. We also conducted a listening test when, where we tried to we use the same signals as the, as the signals that we uh, tested the method. And we, were, we asked the test subjects to sort the signals in terms of distance and say what is further and what sounds closer. And here you can see the results of this uh, analysis, which are um, quite close to the, um, to the known speaker um, um, situation. Yes. This is all in the same room? Yes, uh, we did the testing in two rooms. Test in, two, in the training was. Yeah, room. but the, so these results are all the training and the testing is always in the same room. So you train the same in, the, in, the, in one room and you test it in the same room. And uh, they do that for two rooms. Exactly. So you have a different. Of course, this is one of the biggest problems of distance estimation techniques. Uh, right now to find a way to, to have them work in uh, uh, unknown room environments. How many recordings? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the classifier? Yeah, um, maybe about 20 minutes of recordings for, uh, for the um, um, training and then another 10 minutes for the testing of the method. And the classifier is just GMM and try to find? Yes, as simple as that, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, the second, uh, another thing uh, that I have been working on was uh, trying to estimate distance from binaural signals, which is, uh, it would should be easier to do than, uh, uh, from, uh, than in the case of single channel signals where you have only one input. Uh, for this reason, we have uh, extended our uh, um, um, framework uh, analysis in this binaural case scenario. So here we can uh, also write the relationships as uh, previously, but in this case for the two channels. So convolution uh, of for the left channel and the convolution for the right channel, multiplication uh, uh, similarly in the frequency domain, and then in the DDB domain, we can simply write the same uh, relationships. And then we did a trick and we just subtracted the, the uh, right uh, the right spectrum from the left spectrum of the of the reverberant signals. So by doing this, we can uh, we could get rid of this uh, anechoic uh, signal factor, as you can see here. And uh, in this way, we can determine some uh, relationships for the standard deviation. So this, the standard deviation of the difference between the spectrum of the left and right signals of the reverberant signals would be related only to the standard deviation of the responses. Which responses? The binaural responses in this case, because we had the binaural uh, uh, responses. So uh, the idea is that such a, frame, such a methodology could lead to the, determination of, to the determination of a novel distance estimation parameter. So as you can see here, the, we do the simple thing of just subtracting the left and the right uh, signal spectrum, reverberant signal spectrum, and we calculate the standard deviation, which is proved to be uh, under center uh, specific circumstances to be related only to the uh, standard deviation of the binaural responses, as you can see here. So, as I have already mentioned, if this was just the room response, we know very well that the standard deviation really depends on the distance. Uh, between the source and the receiver. It's highly distance dependent feature when we are below the critical distance of the room. But this is not straightforward uh, in the case of the binaural responses. It, at least to my knowledge, there, there, was no, uh, there wasn't something, uh, um, let's say, well established. So the idea was to, to check if this feature is distance dependent. And uh, interestingly, and but probably expect, uh, it was somehow expected from my side. Uh, the, this uh, differential standard deviation really depends on the distance. So here you can see for an orchestral uh, musical piece, this is a time domain, this is the, the feature that I have already mentioned, and uh, the different colors uh, uh, correspond to the different dist distances between the source and the receiver. And similarly for a, a signal consisting of guitar, you can see that uh, the, the feature seems to be highly distance dependent and seems to re uh, behave in a signal independent way. 
So the idea was to use this feature and uh, uh, Gaussian mixture models, which we had already the framework from the first method I have uh, presented to you, and uh, using uh, two frames of uh, two seconds to extract this feature, and in order to develop a method and uh, evaluate what is the performance. So here you can see for a room, Carolina Hall, uh, it's um, available on an online database. Uh, the mean performance was 75.5% uh, when the system is tested with uh, five different uh, distance classes. And then we were trying to find some ways to increase the performance and get some uh, better results. And the idea was to introduce a, a binaural feature extraction framework. So since we had the available binaural uh, signals, we were able to easily uh, extract uh, binaural cues, interoral time difference, interoral dev level difference and the uh, coherence uh, for several frequency bands, and then calculate several statistical attributes of these uh, features. So this would lead in the uh, calculation of uh, 432 more additional features um, that uh, could be used also in, the, if, in our classifier to, in order to obtain better results. So this, here I should admit that this is really not a, um, it's a, an engineering approach, so, so we were just trying to feed uh, f more features uh, into our classifier. And at this stage we were not really, let's say, concerned uh, of why should these uh, features, these statistical features of binaural cues should be, let's say, distance uh, uh, dependent or uh, uh, something like that. But this was the first step uh, of this, uh, of the, development, of the development of this uh, work. So here you can see the results, which now uh, are much better. The mean performance uh, increased uh, uh, about 20%. And we have used four, only four additional features out of these 430 that I showed you before, that they are, um, that we have um, tri uh, isolated using feature selection algorithms. And this, uh, so now I can get also to your question, this is again a performance in one room. So we train the system in one room and we test it in the same room. But it was uh, of interest to examine what would happen when we would go in uh, uh, other rooms. So here for the easy task of having only three rooms, uh, sorry, three distance classes, you can see that the, the method seems to work uh, quite well. I, uh, you c I can find more information in the uh, paper that it's now in press, and um, I, um, we have uh, analyzed in more detail uh, all these uh, things that I'm referring to right now. Hold for a sec. Can you yes. a little bit back? Don't, don't, you don't have to flip back the slides. Mm -hmm. How you generated the corpus? Is this a uh, room impulse response, is binaural room impulse response is provided by the database? or you measured by them by yourself? Okay, so uh, we have some binaural responses from a database, but we also have some from uh, some rooms in, uh, in, uh, at the university, in a conference center. So I use all these responses. I convolve them with the anechoic signals. I have a database, and uh, then I use this database for the training and the testing. How do you obtain the impulse responses with our impulse responses? Using a dummy head. So we go in the room, we get the, uh, we, uh, we take the dummy head, we put the loudspeaker in another, um, for uh, at different distances, so uh, one, two, three, four, five meters and so on. And we calculate and we measure the responses by the convolving the recorded signal with the anechoic signal that has been reproduced in the room. Did you do this by yourself? Uh, yes, but there are of course uh, software. <laughs> there is a software that does everything uh, easily. So, uh, for example, there is a, I don't know if I should refer to. Okay, but there is a specific software. But of course, you can do it also with MATLAB. But uh, I have the code. But it's something that it's kind of straightforward uh, to do. It's not a difficult thing. It's just the deconvolution of uh, of the input signal and the output signal. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, um, this uh, can takes me now to the um, introduction of a room classification method. So since we had all these uh, interesting features, binaural uh, features, we... Yes, please, please. So it, so it seems like uh, your distance 
estimation is treated like a classification problem, like you have these buckets, one meter, two meters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm not really familiar with the literature on this exact field or yeah. the subtopic, but it, problem, yeah. it would seem like uh, a regression, right? I mean, what if someone's at 1.5 meters? Or what happens if the test subject's at yeah, so 2.2 meters? Or what, uh, that's it right. It's like a regression mm -hmm. uh, classification is more appropriate. appropriate. Yeah, so regression wouldn't work so well. So that's why we have used the uh, GMM. And actually, for the binaural uh, distance estimation technique, we have also used uh, support, support vector machines, which is uh, even more, um, mm, it seems that it works, it's, they are much more robust and they can work very well in unknown and room environments. So, uh, of course, I did some tests with linear regression. I would prefer it if it could work with re linear regression because it's a, it's a procedure that you can fully understand somehow why why some of the features are, let's say, not uh, um, not relevant for the task. But unfortunately the, unfortunately, the results were not so good. So right now, the methods, as they are developed, they are only oriented to work uh, for specific distance classes. And then you have to find some tricks in order to, to if you want to find a, a distance class, class between the two classes. And you know what happened? Like in your class, right? Some of it is actually 1.5 meters. Would. Yeah. So in some oh. cases, it it might go on the other, uh, on the if it's on 1.5, you would have uh, almost 50 percent um, confusion. So it might go on the uh, on uh, uh, on either sides. But in the case of uh, when you are 1.1 meter and then you have the other class, it's at two meters, then you would get it on the on the one meter class. So it seems to, to be quite robust in small distance uh, um, mis, uh, mismatches. Yeah. And that's why it works also quite well in uh, unknown room environments. So since we had all this uh, binaural uh, feature um, framework, we were trying to think of other ways to, to exploit this uh, information. So one idea was uh, whether we could use such a framework for the, for the classification of rooms. But a good question here would be how can one classify, could classify rooms um, according to the reverberation time, to their volume or how big they are, um, according to, the, to some acoustical parameters and how they behave in the rooms, or is there another way to do it? What are like the ways that can tell me that now I'm in a lecture room and I'm not in a big auditorium and what makes this room similar to another lecture room in the same building and so on. So, um, of course, this is not an easy question to answer, uh, but we found in the literature, um, and the work of Floyd Toole, uh, he defines three room categories, but this is for sound reproduction purposes only and small, medium, large, and he somehow uh, classifies them according to the reverberation time. So we have used, um, again, these databases with uh, binaural uh, room image responses, and we have uh, um, separated the rooms in small, medium, and large. We have created the reverberant audio files, and we, have, we were trying to find if these statistical features, binaural statistical features, are related to some of these room properties. So here you can see again this, uh, the binaural uh, feature uh, statistical framework um, and the rooms that we have used uh, for uh, our analysis. So with the blue color, you can see the rooms that they were used for the training and the black color are the ones that they were used for the testing of the method. And here it's the performance uh, of the method using Gaussian mixture models. So we got, let's say, some insight that such a framework would probably also assist some other, um, let's say, scene analysis techniques. For example, this uh, uh, room classification, which is really uh, abstract, of course. And um, some, uh, uh, further work of mine uh, is related to the estimation of acoustical parameters. In this case, we were also trying to estimate parameters, but uh, not from the responses, from the measured responses, but from the signals. So I have done some work related to the estimation of clarity. Uh, of clarity, I don't know if you are aware. It's the, it shows the energy of uh, 
uh, the ratio of the energy of the early part of the 15 first milliseconds of the response over uh, the late part of the response. What is the direct part there? Uh, included in the first 15 milliseconds. Yes, the 30, uh, 50 milliseconds and then over the late uh, part, over the rest of the response. So this is a very typically used uh, uh, room acoustical parameter and it's, um, it shows um, whether there is a good speech intelligibility in a signal and uh, it, many times it's used to, to tune uh, signal enhancement techniques, for example, uh, the reverberation and uh, so on. So we have uh, used the, uh, this uh, um, database, of, database of features using two second frames for the extraction. And uh, we have extracted the clarity of uh, binaural responses and made, these are actually the values that we have uh, um, um, calculated from the responses. And uh, these values were used for the training of the method and the other ones for the evaluation. And in this case, we used the linear regression technique. And it was found that the variance of the interval time, time difference um, were given the highest weights. So the other features were somehow the factors that they were multiplied in this linear regression equation, they were uh, very close to zero. So all these other features were found to be um, less important. And here you can see the results of this uh, analysis. Uh, on the vertical axis, you can see the error. And then on the horizontal axis is, are the actual clarity values. So it works uh, not so well, but it depends on what you want to do. And uh, here you can also see the predicted and the real uh, clarity values uh, as a function of, function of uh, the time frame. So this is another indication that probably such a, an analysis and a, a framework for uh, um, the analysis of signals could also assist the estimation of uh, other parameters such as, for example, the clarity or the direct reverberant uh, um, ratio, which is another acoustical parameter. Uh, in this case, instead of having the 51st milliseconds, it's calculated only using the direct signal, which is the main peak and then maybe five more milliseconds after the main peak. And it's another uh, important and uh, widely used parameter in uh, audio and acoustics. And um, at the same time, there was also some work that it's uh, already existing work that relates the standard deviation of uh, the responses with the direct uh, to reverberant ratio. So using the same uh, framework as before, uh, by subtracting the left and the right uh, reverberant uh, signal spectrums. But uh, in this case, assuming again the statistical independence, we can find um, a relationship for the sound deviation. And then it can be also proved that this differential uh, spectrum is related to the direct uh, to reverberant ratio. Uh, yes? So, excuse me? You're assuming statistical dependence of the left and right signals? Yes, which is not correct, okay. <laughs> always, which is not correct always, and yeah. In the same line of questions, where is the sound source? So you have this set of head-related transfer functions, uh, where do you put the sound source, always in front? Yeah, so for the, uh, for the binaural distance estimation technique, uh, we have done tests for all angles, so um, it works well, if you train the system with various angles and then you test it with various angles, it works quite well. But yeah, of course, we have also tried it with uh, not only for zero degrees, because otherwise it could not be published, of course, because the reviewers would, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's normal, it's, it changes, it change, the signals change a lot. Um, okay, so yeah, we have, uh, concerning this uh, statistical independence here, this is actually work that it's uh, still in progress. And uh, yeah, I have found this. Uh, actually, I was trying not to assume this statistical independence, but these uh, uh, relationships become much more complicated. So I was trying to see if we assume this uh, independence, which could be true for high frequencies and under specific circumstances. And we end up in a, a relationship that relates the standard deviation of this differential spectrum with the direct to reverberant ratio. And that was uh, quite, 
quite interesting, uh, in my opinion. And uh, here you can uh, see that we have uh, tested this um, method for uh, three different uh, signals, cello music, guitar, and uh, speech signal for five different rooms. And you can see on the vertical axis the standard deviation error, okay, because you could also estimate the standard deviation. But this is the most important thing. It's the direct reverberant uh, ratio error, which in this case we used only zero degrees for these results that I'm presenting here. And uh, the prediction error was uh, always less than 3 dB. And uh, it was uh, found that the direct to reverberant ratio could be predicted uh, from binaural signals. Uh, this somehow sums up in a very fast way the work that it's more, let's say, related to my PhD thesis, which is actually part of the text that it's going to be in my PhD thesis. But there are also other things that I have, been, I've, I have done during my PhD studies. And uh, so when I was uh, in Philips for a few months, we have uh, worked, uh, I've been working in a, for an ambient telephony system, and they were trying to estimate the position of various devices situated in the room. So each device would have a microphone and a speaker. There would be like four devices in this uh, uh, setup, four devices in one room, another four devices in another room, and we were trying to find uh, a way to find where these devices are situated in the room. Uh, I can't say more, no. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, okay, so it's the idea is that you have a speaker that he's moving around in the, in the room, and the, um, it's like a conference, an open conference call, a hands-free, let's say, call. You have a hands-free call, and these devices are used to render the sound to... So if the speaker is here, close to this device, then this device would play the signal louder, and then the other devices would play the signal uh, um, with less strength. And the idea, of course, was uh, also that this could be also direct, more directive to, to have a beam of, uh, of, of sound, only the specific position where is the speaker and so on. But this was like for further steps and, uh, of, of this device. But my task was to this automatic calibration, which was to find where are these devices situated. So since there was so a... Pretty much the mutual position of those devices. Exactly, right? yes, oh. exactly. And uh, find also a way to find which devices are in the one room and which are devices are in the other room, and so on. So uh, since there was um, a loudspeaker and the microphone in each device, it was very easy to calculate the impulse responses. So the idea was that, okay, the user buys the system, he gets, uh, he press a button, he gets uh, the system calibrated, and then he can start uh, using it. So I have used these uh, impulse responses. The input of the signal was all these impulse responses between all these points. So we have full matrix of the impulse responses between yes. each of the speakers and each of the microphones. Exactly. So the idea was to use the um, multidimensional scaling technique, which takes as, as input uh, the distances between points, and then it just uh, returns the, the positions, the actual x, y, z, depending if you are two or three dimensions, uh, of, these, um, uh, of these devices. I hope it's clear, <laughs> but I can uh, further elaborate on this. Another thing uh, that I have also some experience is uh, on the subjective evaluation of signal enhancement. Sorry. Yes, please, please, please. So you used your other stuff to estimate the distances. Yeah, so you for the, the when you have the impact response, it's easy to calculate the distance because you get just the, you calculate the delay between the, yeah. And it's easy to, to say this is distance. Oh, so all devices go to the same computer? Exactly. So they're all, they're all synchronized? They're synchronized. And you know the delay of the sound card and all these things. Well, you or you. You, you, could, you could use the same thing, right? Yeah. So pretty much the problem is you have yes. a full matrix of the distances between eight points and you have to find the, the, distribu exactly. the, the geometric which, uh, distribution. Exactly, which is something that I didn't do, but it was the multidimensional <laughs> dimensional scaling that did it for me, but I had to find this method somewhere. And apart from this, there was also the thing of uh, trying to find which devices are in the one room, and then you could 
probably see which responses had similar uh, and let's say reverberation characteristics. So this would mean that they would be like these responses in this room and these responses in the other room. Or you could see that this pair of responses would be not so good. There would be like obstacles in between. So you would know that seven is definitely in another room uh, from uh, device three and so on. Okay, so this is more just to show you that I have done some other things and it's not so probably, let's say, exciting as a research topic. And uh, okay, so I have spent some time uh, collaborating with other colleagues. Uh, he has been mainly working uh, with uh, de reverberation techniques and uh, I have helped sometimes for the uh, evaluation of the algorithms, of uh, the developed algorithms. And many times we have uh, conduct, conducted some listening tests in order to see how the listeners, um, what the listeners think of the, um, of the algorithms and the, uh, let's say, perceptual artifacts of these uh, techniques. So um, here for this we were, I was mainly um, I have mainly worked with the reverberation algorithms and we were trying to extend, let's say, the, um, the um, expertise that there was in the group in the, in the development of the reverberation algorithm, but for single channel, for one uh, uh, single channel signals, to the binaural scenario. And in this case, of course, you have several problems because you would have, if you, if you do s different processing in the right and in the left ear, you would destroy the binaural cues, the IL, the, the interoral time differences, uh, level differences, coherence, and so on. And this would um, also destroy the localization cues of the listener. So the idea was to find a way to do this uh, to, let's say, extend the existing expertise and framework of, for the single channel uh, scenario to the binaural case. And, uh, uh, we have uh, proposed uh, some ideas to to do the same processing here and uh, uh, on the left and on the right signal, um, and by proposing some uh, let's say uh, ideas on the um, on the calculation of this uh, gain that you would use. I don't know actually if you are aware of the reverberation techniques. One way is to use this spectral subtraction, where you decide that you have to subtract some, from some frequency bins, you subtract something which is supposed to be reverberation. So this is done uh, um, using a factor G, a gain, uh, a gain uh, factor, which can be different for its frequency bin. And uh, the idea was to find a way to use the same gain factor for the left and the right signal. And this can be, for example, taking the minimum of this uh, of these two signals, the maximum or the average. So we did several tests and so I... Hold, hold, yes. Hold. You, uh, I, I kind of missed the main point. Okay. You have a dummy and do a binaural recording and you try to do a speech enhancement and deliberation on the two microphones. Exactly. So then after this, when you feed to the headphones of the final user, it to sound less reverberated exactly. than higher quality. Exactly. So you have two, two channel speech enhancement yes. and not pre-distortion of the speaker signal? No, two-channel signal, uh, reverberant signal. So you use the signal, signal. device for binaural recording, mm -hmm. and the problem is speech enhancement and evaluation exactly. of the yes. binaural recording. Exactly, and bearing in mind that there was, uh, the, the, we already had some techniques uh, that they were working in the single channel uh, uh, case quite well and robust with not so many artifacts and so on. But of course, when you want to do it binaurally, it gets more complicated. And there is, a, of course, a no, this is an open research issue right now, in, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, so I have also spent some time uh, working with this, although I, have, I was not a part of the development of uh, these actual methods, uh, but mainly on the evaluation of those. And uh, let's, yes. let's stop a little bit Yes, here. please. So you mentioned that applying some suppression techniques on the both channels independently can cause losing a spatiality. You start to mix the different frequency beams. How you evaluated this? You ask the, the user where was the source at the beginning and when it is when it where is it after the processing? 
So you can have users to listen to two binaural recordings before and after the yes. processing and yes. ask them where the sound source is. So yes. this is how we evolve this is one the, way to the spatial cues. Do it, yes. How but in uh, uh, sorry, just uh, uh, but in this case, it's, uh, this processing we did was not destroying the binaural cues, so we didn't have actually to check whether the the position would be destroyed because we would use the same gain uh, on both signals. But uh, yeah, concerning the number, it would be the 15, uh, 20 test subjects. So usually we don't have so many test subjects for our tests. Yeah, we try to do something on the objective side, means to create a computational proxy and algorithm which does the same. Um, okay, of course, we have used these objective measures the, um, that they calculate um, PESC, and um, there are two others mm -hmm. that they are widely used. Yeah, but they are single channel. They are single channel, that's true, and then, yeah, of course, so you have to evaluate them separately for each channel. Uh, to my knowledge, this is not uh, solved yet. They, they are not like ways to, right now, to evaluate and say, okay, this binaural deliberation algorithm works great because it does this to these metrics. First of all, the metrics were, are already a problem, even in the single case uh, uh, um, scenario, although there, is, there are already some years of work in the topic. But in the binaural scenario, it gets even more complicated because you have to also think of the, these localization cues and uh, other attributes. Thank you. And the last thing that I have uh, also spent quite some time is related to architectural room acoustics. Um, there is uh, lots of experience in my group. So we mainly on the simulation of um, the acoustics of Arche Ar um, ancient Greek theatres, which because there are many actually in Greece. So in this, uh, the last years, after we have simulated all the theatres and we wanted to do something more, we have uh, tried to simulate the, the acoustic effect of wearing a mask. Because in the past, when you, uh, the actors, they would usually wear a mask in the, while uh, playing uh, tra tragedies and uh, so on. So the mask, they change the acoustical characteristics of the actor voice for the listener, but also for the spectators. So we wanted, we have collaborated with a director, so not an engineer. He, it was someone that he was constructing actually the masks. And he wanted to somehow explain some of these odd, audible effects that uh, the actor, actors uh, would mention, like uh, the masks are felt to vibrate, that they resonate on specific frequencies or that the position of the mask would change the acoustic effect, or uh, that they get, uh, let's say, distract, the localization cues are get, uh, get distracted and so on. So we have uh, did some measurements with the dummy head. Uh, that's the dummy head we have. And these are the masks. So there are various types with open ears, closed ears, uh, open mouth. There are some others with uh, uh, closed mouth. and. Uh, we have measured the response using a loudspeaker and the and the and the um, KMR, so uh, the microphones in the ears, but also the loudspeaker on the opposite side. But also using as loudspeaker the the loudspeaker of the mouth, so the radiation pattern of the person uh, speaking, and then um, recording these the responses uh, in the ears. So this would get uh, would lead to the self perception effect. And here you can see some results, which I don't know are <laughs> so much so interesting right now. Um, for various degrees, this is the self-perception eff effect. Uh, these measurements were taken uh, open, open outdoors, since we don't have an anechoic chamber in Greece, unfortunately. It's very expensive to have one. And uh, yeah, it was found uh, we have uh, extracted some conclusions that I don't know if they are so interesting for you right now. And, uh, concerning the boost of some frequencies at specific uh, 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 orientation angles and that there is a high frequency cut in the, in the high frequency range and so on. Uh, so for the future, as now I'm uh, somehow, let's say, closing this uh, first uh, um, part of my work, uh, I have thought of uh, some ideas for future work um, I would be interested to see how one can modify cues, binaural cues, or the signals themselves to, um, to create 
different distance uh, perception uh, um, to the listener. Uh, I would be interested to see if my work could be also um, enveloped in, in special audio encoding, encoding, decoding techniques where you, um, in many times, you need some information of the room environment in order to uh, encode it in the signal. Um, I would like to extend um, my statistical analysis for the single channel scenario concerning the sound deviation and all these things I have referred to, uh, to the binaural case and see more, let's say in more detail, how this spectral standard deviation changes for the binaural case. Is it uh, like, do we get higher values? Do we get this 5.66 dB value of shredder? Um, and try also to, apart from just observe it, also establish a theoretical framework for this. Uh, of course, the, the early reflections is all, uh, always an open topic, uh, uh, actually still an open topic. Uh, we cannot use statistical models, to my knowledge, to model it, but it would be nice if we could do something uh, on this uh, direction. Um, the idea also of um, getting an acoustic perceptual map, so using, let's say, signals. You have a, a binaural signals, which is the common thing for human listeners, and then you can um, say, okay, how far is the sound source, how many, how many sound sources are present, all these uh, um, issues related to the computational auditory scene analysis, uh, which I hope that probably my work could also assist in this direction. And uh, finally, um, exploit the, such information extracted from the signals for signal en enhancement methods and see if we can uh, improve uh, algorithms for hearing aids or uh, other similar applications. So thank you very much. I would be glad to answer your questions. Questions? <laughs> thank you. Yes, please. You said you used 432 features for, for its yes. uh, source mm -hmm. to, to, to mm -hmm. receive a distance estimation. And now, are all of these feature, features based on, on spectrum magnitude, or some of them are also based on the temporal uh, on single time domain yes. phase? Uh, okay. Both uh, temporal and frequency domain. Okay, because yeah. you would expect that you get a lot of information exactly. about the distance yes. from the phase. Yes. And how consistent is this estimate over different placements at the same absolute distance, different placements inside the room? So if you're standing in a corner, does it get worse? Or? Yeah, so for the binaural case, the truth is, is that I haven't uh, tried it. So I haven't done tests in other, let's say, pair of positions with the same distance. But for the single uh, channel uh, scenario, it works well. So the, the good thing with these techniques, because for the binaural distance estimation, actually there are other techniques in the literature. It's not like, I'm not the first person that did that. Uh, but they are really sensitive to small changes, as you say, for example, if you go to another pair of uh, position or if you go to, if you move a little bit further the microphone, it's 1.1 meter instead of one meter, they fail because they are very accurate, but they are also very sensitive. But this feature seems to be more uh, robust, more, uh, uh, they, you cannot get probably the best performance, the top performance, the 100% performance, but it seems that they work quite well for this uh, disagreement in... Uh, are you so for different... So, so you train it for, for one meter, mm -hmm. then you're changing the place. Yes, okay. exactly. So for the binaural uh, distance uh, scenario, I should admit that I haven't tried it, but I, I think that it will work maybe not equally well, but uh, similarly well. Another question yes. is, okay, you have your dummy head pointing to the sound mm -hmm. source at zero degrees. So can, assuming that and the dummy head is actually quite symmetric left and right. Yes. So pretty much the room impulse response from the loudspeaker at three meters to the left and the right ear is, okay, pretty much the same. Similar. We have the right part, it's symmetric. Mm -hmm. And consuming the late reverberation because it goes to yes, physical yeah. parameters, it's kind of the same statistically. Why the difference between those two signals, which are kind of both statistically and, and, and uh, the same, 
matters so much. Do you have any idea? Do, do you have uh, some studies uh, about that? Well, the, the, the reason that I use this di differential thing is because you get rid of the signal. So, of course, if it's like having... So if I, let's say we use only one signal, the assumption is that we, the left and the right signal are almost the same. So why don't you use only one signal, for example? But since we have two signals and we subtract them, and we get something that it's, uh, let's say, signal, it, it takes out the signal. So this is the reason that I have used this sub subtraction. So according to this theoretical analysis, the term of the anechoic signal gets out, and you only end up with a um, statistical attribute of the response. Otherwise, you would have the signal inside, which would uh, have, of course, all these spectral uh, deviations which are uh, difficult to model and... Uh, but then how this works for different angles? Let's say if you are at 90 yes. degrees from me, I can have up to 20 dB attenuation of the signal yeah. for certain frequencies. Yeah, so for in this uh, direction, I think that the, what makes this thing work is actually the classifier that gets trained for this specific angle and then it does the work. But uh, there is definitely something missing in this, uh, in this um, work of mine. So I know that for this thing with the standard deviation, I know that, okay, for the single channel case, I know very well how it behaves for different frequency bands, if it goes to this 5.6 dB and all this. But when you are in the binaural case, you have another situation. You have the sound effect, you have all these, um, let's say, um, uh, f frequency ranges that they are a little bit more boosted uh, in the speech uh, frequency range and all these uh, differences when you compare a binaural response with a single channel response. So I think one should analyze, do the same analysis also in the binaural case, but not only for zero degrees, because with a single ca channel case you have only the zero degrees and you are relaxed. So one has to do this for several angles and then you have to find also a, a theoretical, uh, um, let's say, framework to, um, yeah, to better describe it. And then it might be more, let's say, easier to say, why does this thing work? So right now, I think it works because of the classifier for other angles. More questions there, colleagues? Yeah. Um, um, so, you didn't talk at all about noise mm -hmm. in the room. And so, what happens if, if, I mean, have you tried, like, now you, you know, you train your classifier and then at test time there's, you know, like, yeah, you know, noise. And I'm there, Record but, noise. you know, the refrigerator is humming and the computer's on and the kid is screaming and the projector's on. And yeah, I haven't everything. tried to, to see how these methods work with uh, noise at all. <laughs> I have never tried it. Uh, but I suppose that one could use uh, some uh, noise um, enhancement techniques, subtract the noise somehow, if, if it's not too bad, of course, and the signal-to-noise ratio is quite okay. And then I, I think that uh, you could probably get some good results with these methods. But I haven't tried it. But the, I think that you need this first stage of denoising before you can apply these methods. More questions? If not, let's give a clap. Thank you very much for your time.